Well, our next speaker is no, is no other than the co-founder of the Barnabas Group. He founded the Masters Group. He's had a business career, he's had a pastoral career, and he's mentored many of the men and women in this room, and we praise God for you, Bob Shane. Come on up here and share with us the message. Good evening. Good evening. Um, boy, are you all pumped? I am. Uh, I'm sitting there thinking, where else could you go to have learned about, heard from, and experienced what we've already heard tonight? Uh, I, I looked through that spiral and thought, um, how could you ever come across that collection of critical data about the backgrounds of great ministries that God's using in incredible ways? It just isn't. I'm sorry. Bob Shank. <laughs> Who? Uh, who's calling? This man. Uh, Kelly, it's Governor Rick Perry who said he only has one phone call. Sick humor. Oh, <laughs> you're not listening to the news. <laughs> I was listening to the news uh, yesterday when I got an email from Walt Wilson, who heads Global Media Outreach. Walt has shared with us before. Walt said, I can't put this um, in public distribution, but in June, we had 13 million visits to various language websites from closed Muslim countries, and 1.1 million of them confessed faith in Christ. Um, while on the site. And in July, he said, we had 14 million visits from closed Muslim countries, and 1.4 million of them confessed faith in Christ. He said, we're seeing unprecedented responses to the gospel at the very moment that we're watching ISIS sweep across northern Iraq and uh, challenging religious freedom in that part of the world. So uh, the tragedy... <laughs> You can watch the news 24-7 and you won't hear the moments that God is bringing about in our midst. I don't know about you, but just taping tonight and replaying it to be reminded that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Hey, in the few minutes that I have, because I'm not going to let Dan come up and strong arm me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just share with you a little bit. Um, my role tonight is to be a motivational speaker. Some of you are visiting Barnabas, um, not as members, but in a first or second exposure. Uh, we won't embarrass you, but is this first or second time for you? Why in the world, thank you, why in the world would people get together in a space like this and think about being involved in things that um, they're hearing about for the first time? I grew up in business where service clubs were fairly routine, and um, you could choose your favorite, Kiwanis, Rotary, all kinds of options out there. And service clubs were places where you could come and make a minimal commitment. You couldn't mention Jesus, but a minimal commitment to do something that wasn't going to cost you much time or money, but you were going to go home with 10 or 12 business cards that might provide some traction for your business. Service clubs, a, a little bit of uh, before the parole board required it of you, you could do some community service. <laughs> And, and then Bob Buford wrote Halftime about 20 years ago and began to suggest to people that retirement was toxic and that instead of uh, proving that you're a bad golfer, you could instead find your voice in the kingdom space and while your friends were wandering around saying, why don't the kids call, you could find something to do meaningful that has some kingdom impact so that you didn't have to be embarrassed when you went to church on Sundays. And you know, for some people that propelled them, I found over the course of the last 20 or so years that some people who got the whiff of the fact that we're somehow associated with this whole halftime movement uh, conceptually and philosophically, that they would say, well, Masters Barnabas, I'll think about that when I get within about three years of retirement because then I'll need to get ready for that. Boy, talk about a miss. I, I want to ask you tonight what motivates you to even think about considering involvement in the great ministries that you've already heard about the ones that are going to pr present in the next few minutes. And I want to drive you back to the scriptures for uh, just a moment. I want to read a passage for you that is too familiar, and because of that, I'm going to share it with you from the message. 
Let me tell you why I use the message. I've been around church all of my life. I came to faith when I was five. I didn't bag it when I was a teenager. I stuck around and listened. Um, I pastored a very large church for a few years. Um, I've been involved in ministry out of business uh, while I was in business and then as a career for the last 30. Here's my problem. I know the Bible too well. And when I read passages in the translations that I'm familiar with, my mind tends to skip over it because it's too familiar. I want to share with you from Hebrews chapter 12, the first three verses from the message, because its difference from the translations forces me to listen. Here's what the writer says. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished the race we're in. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith... Go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline in your souls. Friends, um, God's been drilling something deep in my heart over the last few months. I just want to share it with you and I'll be done. I've watched people invited to come check out Barnabas and Masters over the course of the last few years. I watched them come in, I watched them get a full immersion in the ethos of this movement, and I watch them walk out and say, oh, thanks, I'll think about it, and we never see them again. <clears throat> let, let me tell you what I've come to understand. Too many of my friends, it seems, believe that they are Christian entrepreneurs who serve a God who is a uh, cosmic communist. Because their understanding of heaven and what awaits them in the future is some unbiblical notion of a place where God has prepared something that is equal for everyone, that when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, that what he's begun construction on is the eternal embassy suites with 483 square feet for each of us, with a little kitchenette on the side with a microwave and a coffee maker, cable TV with only clean channels and no PG-13 movies, down in the parking lot, there's a big fleet of Ford Tauruses because we all get the same thing. Billy Graham and Mother Teresa get leather interior. We get cloth, but it's okay. Nobody smokes. And, and, and that's eternity, and we're all going to get together and sing every day. Start on page one of the hymn. We'll do all four verses, four-part harmony. We get the pipes 500. We're going to stop and have a big banquet, close down, and do it again tomorrow. And we're going to do that every day, forever. <laughs> I don't know about you, but thinking about that makes me think I'm going to be singing, thinking to myself, it's better than hell. It's better than hell. It's better than hell. And after about a thousand years, I'm going to think to myself, not so sure. Not so sure. Because, friends, I, I, I'll confess to you as a guy who has pastored and been in church leadership, and has attended more church services than a 150-year-old Christian, because when I do church, it's four services on the weekend. So it was yesterday. Listen to me. We don't know where we're going. And we don't know what's waiting for us there. And because of that, we're more dialed in on how to make life here better than we are about how to make life there better. Let me tell you why that's critical. Over and over again, as Jesus sought to motivate the people who had already embraced the free gift of salvation in and through him, he would frequently pose the question, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, let me give you the combination to that lock. I've been surrounded by leaders in the marketplace for 40 plus years, and let me tell you what I found. Everybody wants to be great. True? Everybody wants to be great. They want to do the best they can, and then some, and prove themselves to be best in class. 
Then we come to the context of our spiritual lives and we think somehow that it's a def deficiency in our personality if we somehow aspire to be the best. Really? Over and over again, God invites us to consider greatness in His kingdom as a desirable outcome. Why? Because we're going to a place where I believe that what God is planning to do is to invite us back into what he planned in the first place, which was a place where being part of the family business, today the family business is the Great Commission, before the family business was build out creation. And once the fulfillment of all things, and here, here's the news, there's a new heaven and a new earth that he is going to bring in at the end of all things. And in that space, the restoration of the agenda of the beginning will uh, once again be ours. We hear Adam and Eve were in the garden. To tend the garden, we made them some kind of immigrant uh, blow and mow guys who just sort of maintained the shrubbery. Are you kidding? <laughs> God's work schedule was six days a week, and on the seventh, he took Sabbath. That was the model for Adam and Eve as well, and they were building out creation. Can you imagine we're going to be back in a new heaven and a new earth where we get to build out creation? Why? We're part of the creator family. And here's the good news. We're going to be in a space where there's no sin. Let me tell you what that means. There are no attorneys. <laughs> no building departments. No FDA. No regulators. No IRS. No lost emails. No, all of the things that trace back to sin. Gone. Unlimited opportunity to take vision and create and do it to the glory of God. Why? Because we're chips off the old block. We're men and women who have been destined to participate in a future that we can't even conceive yet. Now, I'm grateful for the warm and fuzzy movies like Heaven is for Real. But let me just tell you, the place we're going doesn't even exist yet. He hasn't yet created it. And we get to be in on it. Oh, and it's a hierarchical society where some will lead and many will not. I love the message when the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 recognizes the performance of those who took what they had been given and produced with what they had been entrusted with. And the master says, well done, you've done a good job. From now on, be my partner. And here's the amazing discovery that is hidden in the clear view of the scriptures. While we're here, we're servants. But depending on what we're doing during the servant era, we may or may not make partner when we finish. Here's the tragedy. Too many people who are here as servants acted like their partners with no need to take into account the intent of their master. Bury it because other things seemed more reasonable to spend their time on? Friends, let me just say to you that the Lord Jesus, according to Hebrews 13, bit down hard, despised the shame, tolerated the cross. Why? He knew where he was going and he knew what waited for him there. And friends, I want to absolutely tell you today, as the writer of Hebrews did, his model is our mandate to anticipate what awaits us there so that, no matter how hard it is here, no how much the attraction or the distraction of other things may be, that the smartest money you could possibly lay down is an investment in eternity, that if eternity does not exist, you're a fool. But if, like the Apostle Paul said, if the resurrection is true, you're looking at the smartest guy in the group. I wouldn't invest myself anywhere else. Friends, the question tonight, as it is every time we convene as the Barnabas group, is, is it possible if the payoff is eternal? If the reality that you get to be partners for eternity in the family business, if that's really there, how much does it make sense to invest yourself deeply for this brief period we call life, anticipating the chance to make partner and to see the potential and opportunity that attends that?
You can be first or you can be last. Who decides that? You do. And the determination of your position when you arrive is founded on what you choose to do with what you've been entrusted with between now and the moment you see the Lord Jesus. We want to make you rich in eternity with the opportunities that are in that spiral. Can I pray for me, Dan, so you don't have to? <laughs> Father, to the degree that um, what I've shared with these folks is out of sorts with your word, make it forgettable immediately. To the degree that we have been distracted by things that are temporary, <coughs> reset us with eternity. Help us to be like the Lord Jesus, who saw the momentary light afflictions of the torture that he experienced on the way to the cross. To pale into insignificance compared to the eternal opportunity that awaited him back on the throne that he deserved, that was his, where he is tonight. And thank you, God, that he has invited us to come sit next to him. But only if we take him seriously. We want to be men and women who demonstrate that seriousness in what we do tonight and every day between here and there. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray.